Welcome to Game Day Sports Radio. I'm your host, GC. I'm joined by Texas teacher Steve Mock. I'm uh, going to reveal the uh, results from the Crazy Eight Challenge this weekend, as well as touch on some of the, I guess I would say, maybe unforeseen developments. I mean, I think everybody expects some, some upsets, but not quite that many, Steve. What do you think? You know, last week when we did this show, GC, I talked about how the one thing lacking this year had been that big upset Saturday, and I think yesterday would qualify as we had nine in the top 25 go down. Yeah, and I think, you know, not only did uh, some of them just go down, I think uh, what was even more surprising is the way some of them went down. I mean, you've got a number four Clemson, you know, and I think, you know, Notre Dame has shown they're formidable this year, but also you're not quite sure what you're going to get with them, but they definitely – uh, not only dominated, but the way they dominated. I mean, they didn't, you know, they, 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 the run game was there, but, they, you know, Drew Pine again managed it, but they did it with a lot of uh, the ground attack and special teams and defense, and they just, they manhandled them. Well, they scored a touchdown offensively, defensively, and on special teams, and Dabo was saying yesterday that's the first time that uh, he's had a game there where his team has allowed all that to happen in the same game. And it doesn't happen very often, but he said give the opponent credit that Notre Dame was just much better. And I like the way he steps up. You know, they don't lose a whole lot, but when they do, he always says, put it on me. Yeah, he does. And I mean, that's, I mean, that's a class act, and he does. And uh, he takes responsibility for it. You know, and I think, too, uh, you know, two, uh, two, two weeks ago, I guess, when uh, they the, the, the played Syracuse and, you know, quarterback struggled and, uh, you know, he pulled them, and they, they, the the backup came in and rallied and had a good game, but, you know, didn't take the position away from him. You know, everybody has a bad game and said it's still his position, you know, but obviously he's got some competition. He's got to prove that he can keep it. But, you know, again, he doesn't just one bad game yank the position from the player. Well, I'm going to bring out a name, a blast from the past here. I know it's someone you recall, but the legend of DJ Ui Unga Lale is starting to look to me a little bit like Ron Paulus, who had a freshman debut for Notre Dame, leading them to a big victory in his first game. And I believe it was ABC sports expert Bino Cook who predicted four consecutive Heismans for Ron Paulus. And by the end of the year, he lost his starting job. And I'm not really sure whatever happened to Ron Paulus. But uh, DJ, all the legends started with a game at Notre Dame, and he threw for over 400 yards. He replaced Trevor Lawrence, and he looked like the next big thing. And now I'm not even sure he's got the starting position down there. No, and I tell you, too, Ron Palace and Bino Cook, those are blasts from the past, and you are right. I do remember him calling for four consecutive Heismans, and uh, it, never, it never developed. I think they came when he ended up with four mediocre seasons. Uh, but, it, you know, it was uh, – you know, and again, Alabama and LSU, another one down in Death Valley. And, you know, Brian Kelly looked like he had his guys ready to go. And uh, not only was Daniels impressive, but defensively, uh, you know, they had some answers. And, I mean, I don't think anybody has seen Bryce Young, who was probably still one of the best, you know, players in the country. Uh, he never could get comfortable and could get settled. I mean, they were coming after him all night. Yeah, and you wonder how much of that is protection, you know, how much of that is on him uh, and not feeling comfortable. But as everyone knows, Death Valley at night is a tough place to play. Uh, without a doubt, without a doubt. And then, uh, and again, I mentioned it on Thursday, and Coach, you know, he gave us some coach speak on, well, you can't let it affect you. But I definitely think not only was Georgia prepared, but they came in with a chip on their shoulder getting dropped from one to three. Um, and I, I definitely think they – uh, I think you probably would have seen a similar outcome, but they, I think they had a little extra motivation, you know, the committee, not intentionally, but that's what ended up being the results. Yeah. When the CFP committee puts them at number three, uh, definitely a slap in the face. And as they were saying on the game yesterday, they certainly didn't do Tennessee any favors by making them number one. Cause you woke up uh, an angry bulldog defense. Uh, only had five players this week to beat the eight ball. Eight ball had six wins, which was, you know, fairly strong considering. And, uh, you know, again, a Washington game that comes down to the wire on Friday night, you know, there's just a couple of plays here and there that uh, could have made or br broke somebody. Todd can turn on you. But the eight ball for the season over nine weeks is 65%, 65% actually, which is pretty solid. So 
That's uh, impressive. And as you said on our show Wednesday night, this looked like the kind of week where either the eight ball was going to lap the field or the rest of us would be laughing at the eight ball. And as it turns out, the eight ball had the magic and went six and four. And I'm impressed that there were five of our players who were able to top that score with as many upsets as we had. Well, let's, let's go ahead and pull this up and see who's going to get the, the weekly win. So on the left, we've got the five players that you can see your names in there. On the right, we actually have the season leaders based off of a minimum of three weeks. But here we go. The eight balls trying to decide who's going to win this week. And for the second week in a row, it's Helen Ann. Helen Ann has had two weeks of seven wins and one week of six and five. So strong showing. Helen has won two weeks in a row. She was one of the five. And uh, I guess luck of the draw, she had a 20% chance. Uh, so there we go. So very um, impressive. Congratulations to Helen Hawkins beating the eight ball twice in a row and uh, being selected to be the winner twice in a row. Steve, I think next thing I want to hit with you real quick is um, uh, is uh, I'm gonna pull this up. I had all this all nice and ready for us on the. Uh, The other thing, it would have gone so smooth, but that's okay. Your screen, window. All right, Steve, so that's uh, what the committee came out with the other night. You know, you have uh, Tennessee, Ohio State, Georgia, Clemson, which is obviously going to fall, Michigan and Alabama. How, how do you see the committee? Uh, give me your top six. How do you see it? How do, what do you think the committee is going to do? Well, I think obviously Georgia will come in at number one after the impressive win. Ohio State, while not very impressive, will probably be able to hold on to number two. Michigan, it took them a while to get going, a little bit sluggish against Rutgers, but putting up 52 points, nothing to sneeze at. And then I think TCU will probably come in at number four, maybe five. I think Tennessee won't drop too far. I think you'll see TCU and Tennessee around four and five. And then we might have to look out west. The name that we've talked a little bit about on this show, Bo Nix, leading the Oregon Ducks. They were number eight last week. I think they'll be moving up. And plus, you have USC coming in. With just a one one point loss to Utah, they were number nine last week. I think they'll bump up a little as well. Yeah, but, uh, and and USC still, I mean, they still have some opportunities to make a move. I think the the meat of their schedule is still still ahead of them. They got Notre Dame. You've got Oregon, you know, who still or uh, USC still has the meat of their schedule left. Um, I think what's uh, is impressive though still is, and you know, I think we've kind of. Got on the horse early with some of, you know, we broke it down just by taking the stats and the names off. But I think you're really going to start to see Bo Nix in that Heisman conversation now with based off the numbers that he's putting up and what he's doing for that team. You know, most of the people who've been riding high ahead of him this year had a rough weekend. So uh, I think the hooker, the QB at Tennessee is going to drop down. Obviously, Bryce Young didn't have a big day. DTR from UCLA, not well. CJ Stroud, now maybe he'll get a bit of a pass because of the crazy weather in, in Evanston, Illinois, with 60 mile an hour winds and the rain coming down sideways. But I think if you did that blind scenario right now, Bo Nix would probably be the top of the leaderboard. Yeah, that, you know, and I think yeah, that's it, it's a good thing to point out too. I don't think people, you know, you look at the score and, and sometimes you got to put context behind it. I mean, there's, you know, came out today. It probably came out some yesterday, but not reported quite as strongly as it probably needed to be. You know, they almost canceled that game at Evanston yesterday because of the weather and the rain and the high winds and uh, and, and just the uh, what they felt for safety issues. And so, uh, I mean, the conditions were up there were almost as, as, as bad as you could play. And so, uh, you know, to even and, and they kept on just saying uh, Ryan Day just wanted to get out there with the wind and, and get home. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, that was an understatement. So. What do, what do you make of something like, uh, you know, you got Oklahoma State who look great, and I know they've got quarterback issues, and I, it didn't look like Spencer Sanders went yesterday. But then you got, you know, Illinois had been riding high, you know, looking great to go into the big – and still set up with, you know, Purdue loses yesterday. They play Purdue this weekend. Winner, that'll go to the Big Ten championship game. 
you know, but how, what do you make of that 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 uh, struggle this week and, and and dropping that game? Is that just a lack of focus, or you know, is it a function of a team not used to being there? Yeah, I think uh, they they probably had risen a little bit above uh, their weight class there, and, and coming up to number sixteen when they really weren't supposed to be ranked at all this year. I think they might started to read their own press clippings. You start to kind of relax and think all we got to do is show up. So, you know, it's one thing when you lose on the road, but uh, losing at home to an unranked team when you're the heavy favorite really talks to a a lack of preparation. Do you think a two loss LSU team, if they get into the title, obviously they, they, you know, they've got Arkansas who's, looking like they're having some struggles and in Texas A&M, which I think we've covered that ad nauseum this year. So you got to feel good that they're going to get into the title game. They beat a Georgia. Do you think they, I mean, obviously they, they, they probably get in, but if they lose a close game, can a, can I think, can they get in with the, you know? Yeah. I, I think they're going to have to win out and even with that, get some help because uh, I don't see the committee taking Georgia, Tennessee, and a two-loss LSU team. And I think Georgia right now is in the catbird seat because they could lose that game and still get in. Uh, The winner of Ohio State, Michigan. And then the X factor, you know, you got to see what happens with TCU. Obviously, if they went out as the Big 12 champion, which is probably the second or at the very worst, the third uh, best conference this year, TCU undefeated will get in that CFP. Yeah, I think there's no doubt they get into the CFP. I mean, I think, you know, and I I think you got to feel good if you're for the Pac-12 to finally get somebody in with Oregon. USC all kind of hanging around the top uh, top ten right now, and you got to figure one of them comes out of there. You know, if one of them comes out of there with one loss and 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 uh, and the title, uh, you know, conference title that they've got, you know, a, a good shot depending on what happens. So, but it sounds like you feel pretty confident that Tennessee takes care of business they'll still find their way in there i think they will i think they'll finish with one loss so you think that you know when people have been talking that the bama win was the strongest win that they had all year but now you see bama they struggled on the road they struggled even going back to last year against florida they lost to texas a&m on the road had to go to four overtimes against auburn on the road struggled on the road at texas this year i mean every game's been a struggle on the road and now they've lost two and they're not looking quite as sharp in the in, it's not the normal Bama used to seeing. So is the committee going to weight that win quite as heavily, you think? Uh, I think they still they still have Nick Saban. They still have Heisman winner, Bryce Young. I think maybe some of the people in your neck of the woods overreact a little bit toward having what toward the rest of the country is a normal season or even a two-loss season is usually a very good season. I think in the latest poll, uh, the AP that came out today, Alabama has fallen all the way to 10. So the sky's not falling, still having a good year, and they'll probably finish strong like usual as well. All right. Well, I think it's, uh, you know, this weekend, uh, not a lot of uh, games. I mean, other than uh, Illinois-Purdue, I don't, you don't have a lot of games. I mean, Alabama's, uh, you know, looking out of it. Now, uh, Ole Miss, you know, they get a win, and they get some help from either Arkansas or Texas A&M. They could find their way into the title game against Georgia. Um, but you know, they've got to take care of some, some business too. But, uh, for the most part, um, uh, you know, just as you go up, um, well, there's you know, a big Oregon, one down in Austin, TCU, Texas. Well, that's true. And, you know, TCU, you got to wonder too, at some point here, TCU keeps coming from behind kind of reminds me of the old cardiac cats in basketball that year. And, uh, you know, at some point that seems to catch up with you, you run out again. And it did, uh, I guess this weekend in, uh, Manhattan, you know, the, uh, you know, Kansas State, who's been coming back from behind some, tried to do it against the Longhorns, and I think they just ran out of time. And again, what, what's you know, again, you're you're out there, you cover the the the, the, the Lone Star State. You know, how, how does it just seem to keep happening that Texas looks so good in the first half and comes out and just becomes so inept in the second half? Yeah, that that's an answer that Sark ha- has to come up with because it's more than just a couple of times now that they look unbeatable in the first half and their offense yesterday with B. John Robinson and Quinn Ewers hitting worthy for TDs looked unbeatable. They had a 31 to 10 halftime lead. You look up in the fourth quarter, it's a one score game. K-State kicked a field goal to get it close. 
Texas answered with a field goal to go up seven, but K-State had a chance to go down and score either a tying touchdown or if they went for two to win that game. So Texas and Sark has got to look at what do we do at halftime to try to mix things up and uh, maintain a little bit of the first half momentum. Yeah, and I, and I, I mean, and I think that's, and I think that's, uh, do you feel like B. John Robinson's getting overshadowed just a little bit this season? And I mean, I think, you know, he's been the workhorse in a lot of times with somebody you can lean on, not that Quinn Ewers and, and, and the quarterbacks have, and receivers have done a good job, but um, he's just been doing his job quietly. But, you know, you look up last night, 200 plus yards rushing. Uh, it's not the first time, had a great game, you know, all season long. It just seems like you don't really hear his name mentioned much. Yeah, I, I think when, when the one loss record is the way that it is, a lot of times players with the good stats get overlooked, but he is the heart and soul of that offense. Everything they do revolves around him, and then once he gets it going, it opens up the passing game for Quinn Ewers. All right, Steve. Well, as always, it's a pleasure. Um, look forward to seeing you on the Crazy 8 pick on this week. Um, you know, obviously, we always have a good time on that show. Pope joined us this week, you know, kind of made his call and, uh, uh, you know, it's going to, there's going to be some interesting games. The slate will be out tonight. We're just about finished, uh, uh, working with, uh, the, the, uh, the, the team here at game day sports radio that, that puts those together and makes the selection of the games that to try to get the most competitive since we go head to head. Um, but always a pleasure to talk to you. And, uh, you know, we got a couple interesting weeks coming up here with Thanksgiving and, uh, um, and, and, and you know, I think it, you know, you know, just real quick, you know, it's been, you know, you're still probably going to get two SEC teams in there, but you're going to get two different SEC teams, you know, but you're probably not seeing Clemson. You're obviously not seeing Alabama. You think that's going to be good for the college football playoff to see some new new teams injected in there? Yeah, I think for most of the country, very happy to see some new blood. There you go. All right, Steve. Well, always a pleasure. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk to you this week. Sounds good. Thanks, GC. Thanks.